usual format names pronouns and icebreaker question uh which for today will be uh since we all live in different areas um what is the favorite thing about where you live and i will go first so my name is jonathan pronouns are he him and my favorite thing about where i live is the fact that i live downtown so i'm in a very walkable city um, and then even things that I can't necessarily walk to super quickly, I'm always close to transit stations, BART stations, bus stations. Um, so I never have a difficult time getting from point A to point B. So what about the two of you? Well, uh, I can go. My name is Michael, he, him pronouns. Uh, my favorite thing about where I live is that we actually have all four seasons. Uh, I really appreciate the, especially like the time in between when they're changing. Um, I know it's nice to, nice to see that like passage, passage of time reflected in nature, even if I am in a city and it's not, not like tons of trees and stuff, but mm. that is one of my favorite things. Nice. Okay, so I guess that leaves me. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and I didn't realize you guys were talking until I noticed the blue squares. So if you're talking before that and talking to me, I apologize for not picking it up. Um, my favorite uh, thing about living in my city is, I don't know, the vibe. Like, you know how every city has a vibe? Um, mm -hmm. It's very chill. It's very progressive, luckily. And yeah, it's very. I don't know how to describe it, but it's nice. <laughs> nice. OK, well, I'll ask, what do the two of you think of uh, Mouth, the short story collection by Paloma Gosh? Um, I can go. I liked it a lot. Um, I'm a big fan of horror and sci-fi type stuff, and uh, I also really enjoy the short stories and anthologies. Um, it's like overall, I, I enjoyed it. Some of the stuff was a little uh, intense <laughs> or like maybe unexpected, but um, it all it all made for a good read, and I appreciated that. Um, yeah, I wasn't expecting this much of sci-fi themes as well. Well, not as well, but uh, yeah, I, I've been meaning to read more um, sci-fi things, more fantasy, more kind of horror thriller stuff. I wanted to venture out more from romance. So this was a nice little um, adventure to that. I liked it, but I kind of found it difficult to keep reading because um, it was my first time reading like a collection of short stories. So um, after I finished a short story, I needed um, to reflect and like just absorb the story before reading the next one. So that kind of like stunted my um, reading progress, but it was a nice book. I liked it. Yeah. OK, I feel kind of bad because like last month, I'm the odd man out. Um, I really didn't like it. Uh, there are definitely some stories that I thought were very, very strong that I loved, but it was such a mixed bag. Um, almost to the point to where it felt like I was reading a bunch of different authors in a collection as opposed to a collection written by the same author. Like, for example, there were some stories, uh, I won't go into what stories now, but there are some stories that the writing was super on point, the the character development throughout the story, even though they were all short stories, was great. The horror aspects were really great, even some of the sci-fi stuff, which I don't tend to lean towards, but that stuff was good too. But then it was like, some of the other stories just felt like, what are we doing? Where are we going? Why did you write this? Um, and I think that, that came through so strongly for me in the first story. The first story I thought was great. It was creepy, it was unsettling. 
Uh, it was not what I expected. I didn't think the story collection would contain uh, sex at all, really. I didn't really think about that going into it, but all of that I loved. And then the next immediate story, I absolutely was totally bored by, um, almost to where I didn't want to finish it. Uh, so yeah, I think Arian, you said that at times it felt difficult to keep going. I felt that as well, not because I had I needed time to reflect, but because I wasn't sure if I wanted to waste my time on the next story. Um, so that is very harsh, but unfortunately that is my opinion. Um, so last time Michael and I did uh, a short story collection book talk, we each picked like two or three stories to go over in detail. Um, as opposed to going into each and every one, because I feel like that would take us very long. Uh, so, Arian, what do you think of that idea? Um, or do you maybe want to go into each one? What would you prefer? Um, I'm sorry, I was zoned out. Could you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I did get the question. I'm sorry. Uh, so, last time Michael and I did a short story collection book talk, we uh, we each picked two or three different stories to go into detail uh, on, as opposed to going in detail on every single story. I was asking, are you okay with that as well, or do you want to go into each story? Oh, um, the two to three stories would be perfect, actually. Yeah. Okay, great. So, no problem. So which stories do you guys want to go into? I have my three. I'm curious what you guys' three are. Um, I, I think my three would be Desiccation, Supergiant, and... Um, I don't remember the name of the, there was one that was really, really short. Nip. Mm. Okay. I, I think mine would be uh, the fig tree, leaving things and, I don't know my third one, but I'll decide it by the time. <laughs> Oh, and I definitely said the wrong one first. I did not mean to say, I think I said desiccation. I meant to say um, leaving things. Okay. Okay. Well, my three would be desiccation, uh, Nip, and Natalia. I guess I should ask, did we all read the entire collection? Did we all read all those stories? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. Cool. So let's start with desiccation since it's the first story. Uh, <laughs> what did everyone think of that story? I thought it was creepy. Mm -hmm. um, going, going back, reminding myself because this was the first one I read. Um, I am curious, and I'm sure we'll get to this. Um, but every every time I read a collection, I want I want to know why the first story was first. Um, and I'm curious if anyone has any any thoughts on that, or thinks that this is like maybe maybe the best story, or or one that uh, captures something that for some reason makes it makes it the first one in here, but. Um, no, that's it. I'll stop. I'll stop talking for now. <laughs> okay, so I guess what I thought about the first story was, um, wait, I wrote something. It was ice. Oh, skating vampire lesbian. Come on, dystopian backdrop. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really liked the vibe of the story and how isolated it was from the start. Um, I don't know if I'm remembering it correctly, but the labelless gray packaging in the food market really drove home the dystopian aspect of it all. So I really liked that part in particular. Um, I found it weird, not weird, but like it was just jarring, like how the sudden shift of like the (laughs) sexual start between the skater, I forgot their names, but the skater and the um, mysterious skater girl, the vampire, let's just call her the vampire. Um, Yeah, I was kind of like taken aback at how how sudden it was, but I I liked it. I guess it doesn't, it doesn't it doesn't take a lot to entertain me. I guess that's what I'm taking away from this. Uh, I don't know why it was put as the first story, um, but I think it might have set the tone for the stories going forward. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree with the two of you. It was definitely, I don't know if I would say it's my favorite story out of the collection, but it's definitely up there. Um, Very creepy, very unsettling. Like Arian, you said, it took an unexpected turn with the sex stuff. Um, Even the whole necrophilia, like, masturbation scene, I was like, oh, okay. Um, I loved it, but it was definitely unexpected. And yeah, I mean, there were certain parts of the story I didn't totally understand. Like, I kind of wish even in like a throwaway line or like a very, very short summary that we would have included why all the men in the town had to leave and like what they were doing. I mean, what they were doing isn't really relevant to me, but like why, who started that, you know, what was the point behind that? We never got any of that. So that was what my main thought or my main question was throughout reading the whole story. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I think to answer Michael's question, why it was the first one, I agree with Arian. I think it really sets the tone for the entire collection. Um, also, I think that the title of the collection, Mouth, uh, it goes best with that because that entire story to me is about uh, devouring. It's about uh, I think like vampirism to me is like, it's all about your mouth and your teeth and eating. Um, And I don't mean that as a pun for the sexual stuff, but that's in there too. Um, So yeah. Uh, (laughs) And I guess I'll ask as a first question, why do you think all the men had to leave? Like what conclusion did you both draw from that? I think I just assumed it was like a war thing or that's what I was like filling in in my head. Um, and actually, I, I was very curious to hear hear your guys' response to this too, or if you backfilled with any any anything like from your own own imagination or your own ideas to make it make sense. Um, the two things that I thought were like war, like you said, or like kind of like the science type of experiment sci-fi thingy where they needed men like something along those lines but i had no idea either i i it would have been nice knowing too yeah yeah i agree with the two of you i think i did assume it was uh like a draft sort of thing simply because the men had to all be over 17 before they're sent away um and then i think There is a moment where the main character says, I don't remember her name, unfortunately, she says that uh, the government has to sell sperm um, to women and it's like incredibly expensive. So I thought maybe that's like some kind of government conspiracy to like make money off of babies or something like that. Um, But yeah, outside of that, I couldn't really get a reasoning why. Um, And I would have loved to get one because it was definitely a major part of the story, but yeah. And I guess I'm also curious, do you guys actually believe that Pritha, that was the vampire girl's name, do you believe she was an actual vampire? 
or do you think that she was something else? I definitely assume vampire, but I'll also acknowledge that that was just like an easy, easy feel for me when she was like drinking blood and her skin was gray. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there, there are probably definitely other other options, and I wonder too. Like I didn't, I didn't do any any sort of checking here, but I know that um, there is there's like a lot of. Indian Indian stuff in these stories um, because of the author's background, and if there is some sort of like, do either of you know if there's some sort of like similar similar thing in in Indian lore or mythology about vampire-like creatures that would that would fit here? No. Um... Literally none that I'm aware of. Um, but yeah, I uh, I just rolled with the punches. Uh, yeah, a vampire, sure, why not? Uh, when she was drinking the rat blood behind the dumpster or something, I was like, yeah, sure, that's that's a vampire thing to do, or vampire adjacent if she wasn't a vampire. I feel like Harshit would have been able to add a lot if he was in this meeting right now. It's a shame he wasn't here though. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with the two of you. I, I did assume that she was a vampire, but there is a moment where uh, the main character confronts Preeta and she like accuses her of being a vampire and Preeta's like, what are you talking about? Vampires don't exist. And I wasn't sure if that was like her trying to throw the main character like off her trail and like mess with her, or if like she really was not a vampire. But if she wasn't, then why was she eating rats behind the dumpster? And like, we know she has some sort of influential powers because she's able to make the main character fall during her uh, during her ice skating performance. And all of that to me reads as vampire, but maybe she's a witch, maybe she is, I don't know. Um, so yeah, yeah. And I guess I'm also curious, what did you think of the, the main character's necrophilic interest and then her love of all things like cold and like icy and clammy. Do you find a connection there? I mean, I, I think there's definitely a connection there. Um, I don't know, those things go like hand in hand, unfortunately, like being being cold and death um i i did think it was like a little i don't i don't, I don't want to say heavy or, or anything but it was it was a little uh a little bit of an intense thing to throw out like beginning of the book um but that's it that's all my thoughts um yeah, pretty much what the both of you have already said. It was just, um, it tied it in with the vampire and being dead and stuff. And yeah, I don't have much more to say on it, honestly. Yeah, I do think there's a connection there. I mean, we know that, uh, I guess her interest in necrophilia is seeing the bodies on that like cold uh, metal examining table. Um, so I definitely do find a connection there. And then it's also interesting her obsession with Preetha because she has, of course, the same kind of like cold, dead feeling body. Um, and then also it's interesting if Preetha is a vampire, she kind of is, she loves the moment where Preetha is giving her oral sex while she's on her period. Um, and that to me almost kind of read as like, what if she kills you? You know, like if she drinks blood and has an obsession with drinking blood, what if she goes too far and kills you? And I guess that kind of, I don't know what she even call that, but that sort of like playing on the edge kind of thing ties into her necrophilia as well. Uh, her imagining herself being the dead body. So, yeah. 
I know the two of you want to discuss the fig tree. That is one I really didn't like. So I don't have a lot of thoughts or questions on that. Do either two of you want to lead that little discussion? Um, I definitely did not say the fig tree, so I will not I will not volunteer for that. Um, but I will uh, happily review it and um, see if I have anything to add. Maybe you guys said leaving things. Did you um, just say leaving I, things or the fig tree? Oh, I, I said got those fig tree. I, was I the only one who said the fig tree? Well, I think you were then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, the fig tree. Um, yeah, so like I always try and find myself in any story I read, right? So like, um, yeah, I found it surprising. Um, the story didn't have much tang, I guess. It was very just, um, yeah, it was all um, monotone, I guess. But I really like that about the story because not everything has to be um, action after action. And there wasn't really much um, punch to the story, I guess. But I like the story. <laughs> OK, wait. So um, I noticed themes in the story of like grief, familial duty, and like love. Um, there was a part of the story where the main character confronts her dad um, while they were doing the ceremony for her mother's burial or for her ashes being thrown in the river. And she asks her dad if uh, her mom really loved him, if she actually loved him. And the dad uh, just brushed it off by saying uh, it was a marriage. Uh, there was no need for love or something along those lines. And um, yeah, I really digged with that. Um, Something about that, it was just really, wow. The whole story of the main character tries to like get a grasp of her mother, like a clearer idea or a clearer picture of her. And um, her name's Anita, there, I remembered it. Um, so Anita tried getting a clear grasp of her mom. And with that question, I felt like, uh, um, I got a clear grasp of her mom because uh, it was like fed through the story, fed throughout parts that her mother was uh, wasn't willing, like she was forced to go into this marriage. She had another lover. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and at the end, everyone no, throughout the story, everyone's like cautious of the fig tree. Um, everyone's saying, don't go there. Everyone's discouraging her from visiting the fig tree. And maybe um, it's because I, it's because if you go near the fig tree or something, you might get possessed or that's what I got from it. Uh, because of the sudden shift in Anita's mother's behavior, all of a sudden, like a few months into their marriage, so I had a feeling that the fig tree influenced that or something. Uh, a lot of things about ghosts and Anita's mother appearing as an apparition towards her. Uh, I think <laughs> I'm so messy. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so. I like the story because of its themes of grief, familial duty, and love. I love how monotone it was. I love how it felt because it was familiar to me. How Anita felt like a stranger in her own homeland, was grappling to understand her mother, and uh, tried in her own way to reconcile with uh, her culture there. Um, yeah. I was just curious what you guys thought of the fig tree. Like, because I had a feeling the fig tree possessed Anita and Anita's mother at the end, but I don't know if I was just misinterpreting that. I had, I actually, I was going to ask the same thing. Do you think the tree is actually evil? And did you see any 
connection between this story and the last one. And I think I realized going back through this one uh, and just like flipping through, for some reason, I envisioned like the exact same house when I was reading both stories. Um, just in one of them, it was a fig tree, and in the other one, the house, uh, it was a, a persimmon tree, um, which I was was not intentional, but going back through, I'm like, oh, that's why I had them a little bit confused because it's two different stories. Um, but. Yeah. Do you do you think the tree was actually a tree? Do you think it's evil or like some sort of, of creature or something? Or um, I thought you were. Uh, uh, I was waiting for Jonathan to answer. Sorry. Um, I think it is like a real creature or something, uh, because when the tree gave her the bangle or something, her white bangle changed into bone yellow dry bangle and that to me signified like um the tree exerting its influence or something on anita and i think the tree was not necessarily evil but like it was definitely like oh it had its own agenda that wouldn't really align with yeah normal values and morals I think there is one other thing you said, and this is my my last thought on this one. But yes, I I think I agree with you on what you just said. Um, you mentioned something about about grief being a big theme in here. I wonder if you picked up on like anything representing the stages of them. I definitely got like the taking the bangle as acceptance, and felt like I got some hints of some of the other ones. Um, but did you see any like explicit connections there, or or even any inferred ones that you? that you thought represented like stages of grief? No, I never really, um, like consciously, I never thought about it. But um, actually, no, I just felt the grief. I didn't really notice or like mark the stages. Yeah, no, sorry. But I see your point for sure. Um, Jonathan, do you have any thoughts regarding the story? I have very few, but you guys talking kind of gives me a couple. Uh, first, I to answer, I don't know who asked, but whether or not I believe the tree is evil. I don't know if I believe the tree is evil. I think that uh, the tree gives the women that it influences or talks to some sort of confidence or like courage. And I think that in certain cultures where women are expected to be a bit more like subservient or quiet, especially in your marriage, uh, that can be seen as evil. Because once the mother begins to talk to the tree, uh, she kind of comes out of her shell. And that is when the father begins to love her. Um, but prior to that, I'm assuming that she would have probably just been like a very meek, quiet woman. Um, and then the same goes for uh, the main character, Ankita. She, I don't know if I would call her quiet or like subservient prior to seeing the tree, but I think through the tree, she learned to accept her Indian heritage, which it kind of seemed like she was embarrassed by prior to that. Um, I think one of the primary examples of that being that she didn't want her husband to come with her to see her family simply because he doesn't fit in and would, of course, embarrass her. Um, so, yeah. And then, Michael, you did mention that uh, you were wondering if the first, if this story and the last story, Persimmons, were connected. That was my same question. I would have really loved to see the author connect the two because they both deal with uh, this, like, mystical you know tree being um but so I, going into it i was thinking that's where we were going to go but then it's revealed in the last story of persimmons that that story takes place in space and that for me ruined that whole illusion um and yeah i, I don't know do you have any thoughts on that area do you think that the first that this story and the last story of persimmons could possibly be connected uh no i I never got that vibe, honestly, because uh, once the space was thrown in and the patches of a gray planet was set, 
um, I never really saw the connection or like similarity between it. Uh, yeah. And I believe you two said you want to discuss leaving things. Is that correct? That's the wolf girl, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, with that story, what did you guys think of that? It got more of a reaction out of me than anything else in the book. Um, so I think that is, that is one of the reasons I want to discuss it. Um, I, I think also the, the break from the first two stories have such like a strong cultural tie to, to India, and I don't think we really get that in this one, um, made it feel a little bit I don't. I don't want to say out of place, but maybe not. Not what I was expecting after reading the first two. So that was another reason I wanted to. I wanted to uh, talk about this one. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about this one because it really was a break. Like it did feel a bit out of place compared to the first two stories. That's for sure. Um, I'm. It was the story that made me go like, whoa, okay, let's see what other stories this book has to offer, because this was wild. Oh, um, yeah. Um, so my thoughts on the book was just, um, damn, <laughs> it was a full circle moment right there um, with the main character um, always believing that someone would leave her, that her partner would leave her, and then the wolf actually leaving her, um, especially in, a, in, in that way, where she ended up turning into a wolf and he ended up becoming more or maybe fully human. Um, that was wild. I'm curious, though, um, whether or not you guys thought that she was a special case. Like, was this, did this specific instance of turning into a wolf happen to her alone? I mean, probably not since the first wolf um, had a half human hybrid, but like, um, how widespread would this have? Oh, no, I'm getting my question mixed up. I'm sorry. Let me get back to that later. But what did you think? What did you guys think of the book? I'm like really, really curious. Yeah, I, I think to Michael's point, this is a story that I don't know if I would say I really enjoyed, but it definitely got a reaction out of me. But I have to say the only reaction I really got was the birthing scene. I was like, OK, cool, horror, creepy, loving it and the sex stuff. Um, outside of that, I was kind of like, okay, like, where's this going? Um, and yeah, I think to Arian's question, I know you said you wanted to wait, but I, I, I am curious about that because that's a question I have as well. Uh, we know that in the, when this whole wolf thing in whatever place the story takes place in begins, a bunch of women begin to disappear um, and then more wolves come. Did you guys get the impression from that that the women who are being taken into the woods by the wolves are being turned? Or did you think like they're being killed and then something else is happening? What did you guys make of that? I did not think they were being turned until the end, um, but that was probably just me um, being a not observant reader. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, th I think it was very much set up for us and I just, drove drove right through it and, and didn't notice what was happening. Uh, yeah, I think they did get turned. Like, that's the main reason women were being um, taken or attacked. Um, 
this is really off tangent, but it might be why I feel so strongly towards this particular story. Um, I was able to bring it up as a topic with my work crush, and he said he'd read it. Oh, so I'm excited for his um, thoughts on this story in particular. Um, yeah, it was just outlandish enough to be interesting for someone who doesn't read books. Um, and it gave us a nice little talk. Oh, yeah, super off tangent, but that really affected how I felt about this story for sure. Yeah, I think I also believed that the women were being turned um, because I got the impression that the wolves only attack women because we know there are men who are in the town, the few that are still left, and they're not being attacked. Um, so I'm assuming all the wolves are she-wolves. And that would also make sense to Arian's earlier point that the wolf that comes to the main character at the beginning has a half-human baby. I'm assuming she probably was a pregnant human woman who was then turned, which would explain her baby being half-human, half-werewolf uh, or wolf. Um, so yeah. And I, I'm curious, what did you guys make of the sex stuff in this book? That, for me... <laughs> I definitely saw it coming because we know that the main character was like uh, listening to the, uh, I don't know what she named him, but the the wolf boy masturbating and all of that. Uh, so I definitely saw that coming, but it was a bit uncomfortable to read because I think in my mind, since she was raising the wolf boy, even though he progressed very quickly, and I think it was like a couple of weeks that he became a full adult man, I kind of got the impression that he was her son. And then when they started to have sex, I was like, uh, why are we doing this? Um, what, what did you guys make of that? Did you think they were like mother and son or something else? Um, it, it definitely felt incestuous to me. Uh, even though I know that they're not like related by blood like the the raising was a little um i don't i don't know it, it it crossed a boundary that in in my mind in my world would i wouldn't cross um <laughs> but I, you know i guess the story i also um just sort of like a broader thing like between between this and I mean, the first story, and there are quite a few other things we've read that have these like strange, strange connections between like, like sex and like body horror and like really, really kind of gory, gory or uh, like taboo things related to related to sex. I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts on why those things come up so much in these. And th this one wasn't even a like quote unquote queer story. Um, but why why those things come up so much? If you guys have any thoughts on that, um, the mother and son dynamic uh, was definitely there, so it felt weird for sure. Um, it felt uncomfortable reading it. Uh, you you expected it, but it was still like kind of a sucker punched, not really a sucker punched the gut, but like someone was like squeezing your intestines while you were reading it. Um, uh, I think like the reason why sex was brought up so much um, is because it's like um, masks. So it fits with the entire title of the story. And it was like, um, sex as a whole is kind of um, um, intimate, um, kind of closed doors. Um, I think it was just um, used as a way to keep the story going in some of the stories. I feel like it was used as a storytelling device in most of um, I don't know what I'm saying, but um, the sex in all the stories was definitely um, interesting there. I did find it interesting how this was one of the fewer, um, this might be the only explicitly 
heterosexual story. Like there were hints, there were mentions of the other main characters of other stories being um, uh, having sex with both genders. But I think this was the only one that was uh, explicitly described that way. Um, unless you guys noticed any other stories like that, then feel free to correct me. But I found that interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I noticed the sexuality of our characters being a bit of a mixed bag. I think the author might be bisexual or pansexual, because I know she is married to a man, but she also identifies as queer. Uh, so that makes sense that she would do that in her stories mm -hmm. to me. Um, but I think also the fig tree was, I don't know if we ever mentioned her being involved with women, but I know she's married to a man, that character. Um, and I don't remember all the stories in Fortune, so I don't know how many of them are straight, but there's a couple times where I noticed characters being heterosexual. Um, same thing with uh, Lemon Boy, that one as well. Uh, heterosexual seeming character, at least. Um, so yeah, and it's funny you ask that, Michael, that you feel the sex came up so much in the book. I didn't. I only really got sex in a couple of them. Maybe there's something I missed. Um, so could you, like, I guess maybe expand on that or, like, how you came to the conclusion that sex felt so important to the stories? Um, I, I don't know that it, like, necessarily feels important to the stories. I just, I notice a lot um in in some of these stories and and in other things that we write outside of this particular book there is this connection between like um sex and like like body horror or gore or like like death and dismemberment um and it just it's it's come up so often and it comes up more than once in this book uh and i was just curious if anyone had any like thoughts or or insights on why um why that might happen so often i guess i don't really have any thoughts on that but i think at least in, for this book in particular the moments where there are sex or at least where i picked up on the sex it's like a teetering line of like sex and murder um like for example i think of uh leaving things as the primary example we know during that sex scene, like he's like clawing her up and she's like bleeding and screaming. Um, so I guess maybe the body horror and sex kind of go hand in hand because it feels kind of murderous to me. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that, Arian? I never noticed until now, but you're right when you said that the sex and body horror and like the uh, possibility of murder was there. Uh, no, no thoughts, but now I'm trying to go back to the stories and see every instance of it. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Michael, that you want to share? Um, no, I did have one other quick thing on, on this story um, or, or a question to see if anyone else had a similar thought, um, but I definitely, I definitely felt like it was um, a commentary on on chosen isolation, um, mm -hmm. and it made me think a little bit, or wonder if it was any sort of like reflection um, on on like the pandemic or anything like that, or. You know, it is very explicitly like wolves in the story. The lone wolf thing is like a, you know, really like a tried archetype um, that we're we're all very familiar with. Because um, she has plenty of opportunity to like be around other people. Um, like there there are opportunities there, and she refuses every single time. Um, I'm just I don't know. I, I found that. I don't want to say hard to reconcile with, but it makes me wonder, like, why, why push away all of that, all of those opportunities for connection for something like, uh, you know, like unknown and on your own.
It's funny you mentioned the pandemic because I didn't think about that till just now, but that story definitely does feel very pandemic-y. Um, I don't know how much of these stories were written recently or older stories, but although I do know that some of the stories in this collection were a part of her, uh, the author's, I believe, college thesis or portfolio to get her MFA, one of those. Um, so it's possible one of these is written during the pandemic, but that story does feel very much like pandemic kind of setting. But I, I do think to your point on the chosen isolation, I guess the title leaving things and the trauma of the character's life of having all the people in her life essentially leave, especially the men, um, it, it kind of makes sense that she would choose to be alone. I think that if you have this constant fear that being with people, you will eventually get left behind, you would eventually just, I guess, stop trying and choose to be alone. Um, so that actually made, I guess, total sense to me. I didn't really find it hard to reconcile with. Did you notice that connection, Arian, or did you find that hard to reconcile with? Um, no, it made sense to me as well. I never saw it in the pandemic kind of point of view. So thinking it that way definitely adds more to the story. Uh, but yeah, no. Now, there's a story that I don't really have a lot of thoughts on, but I do have one big question uh, that, for me, stuck with me throughout the entire story, uh, and that is K. That's the one about the bird lady, uh, like, maintenance person, whatever. Um, I found it interesting that that main character's, that story's main character is a pathological liar, and I'm curious, when you read that in the story, did you then take everything in the story as being false, or did you believe any of it at all, knowing the character as a pathological liar? Um, well, now I'm rethinking the whole story because you said that. <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't until I also, uh, unfortunately, like, I think way too often give benefit of the doubt and take my narrators as reliable until proven otherwise. Um, and this narrator explicitly told us like on the first page <laughs> that she was unreliable <laughs> and I just, just just like the thing with the wolves, um, <laughs> kept, kept, kept on reading looking for my happy ending. Um, but um, I, I didn't, but... Uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'm curious to hear what Arian has to say and, and to hear what you have to say since you asked the question. I didn't either. Um, I, I'm i very much like Michael, where I just roll with whatever the uh, narrator says. I should, I should be more doubtful, um, I think. But yeah, I, I was like, yeah, sure throughout the entire story. I I was just, yeah. It's funny that you two mentioned being so trusting of your characters, because I guess with my question, it kind of points out that I'm not really trusting. And I'm kind of thinking, is that a good thing or a bad thing? But uh, yeah, I, I don't think I really believed most of the story. I think even the final end of the story, where the character says that, um, the two beings, the bird lady, and then I didn't totally understand what the shadow creature was, but that creature as well, were fighting over her body. And then she says, at least that's the story I tell myself. Um, and when I read that, I assumed everything was a lie. Because if she is able to say that she's a pathological liar and can't be trusted, I can't believe her story, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you two didn't pick up on that because that was like my main thing was like, this is all one big lie. But yeah. And then I know Michael and I want to discuss Supergiant, so we can go on to that one. Um, what did you guys think of the story Supergiant? I think this was my favorite one in the uh in the collection um it did it did go very heavy sci-fi 
uh, <laughs> which I wasn't, I was not expecting from the collection, but we did get with quite a few things. Um, but I, I appreciate that. So that may be one of the reasons I enjoyed it so much. Um, but I liked that I felt this story was giving uh, like a little bit more, more commentary on like, um, like social issues and an image that we didn't necessarily get in some of the other ones or that I didn't, or maybe I just like this one better because um, some of the other ones do definitely have that commentary on some of those things. Uh, but yeah, that's it. those are my general thoughts. Um, yeah, this was the makeup artist, right? Yeah, it was. This was the pop star. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it was very, um, uh, I think this was the most sci-fi of the stories, because it was, um, skin and reattaching and whatever. Uh, I liked it. It was especially the end where um, they had a happy little ending. Yeah, I like happy endings, so I like the story. That's that's most of my thoughts. I think to agree with Michael, this is definitely one of my favorites as well. Uh, I think just because I'm such like a pop of cult, pop culture obsessed little gay boy on the inside that like I was gonna love it. As soon as I read that she was a pop star, I was like totally in it. Um, and it made me sad that this is one of our shortest stories because I loved it so much. Um, and I, I, I'm curious, did anyone find it interesting that even though our main character is described as being this like perfectly crafted, like unbelievably beautiful human being, um, she's never directly described physically. Uh, did you notice that as being important? I think for me that came across as like the author was letting letting us draw our own conclusions uh, on what she looks like based on our own ideas of beauty. Did anyone else notice that at all? I did notice the only physical description we got was when um, her jaw was being unhinged. <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> like her skin was coming off were the only times we got like real, real descriptions of her body. But um, yeah, I definitely, I think like filled in with uh, like de facto like pop star imagery, um, in in the absence of like a real, a real like solid physical description. Uh, which is funny because we do get like a nice, a pretty, um, detailed description of, um, of what's her name? None, nothing. Mm -hmm. Of the other character, right? Like bless. Get some, yes. bless, sorry. Yes, that's it. Thank <laughs> you. Um, we we do get uh, you know a, a few like actual descriptions of this. Um. Yeah, I never noticed it. I should have. I I really should have. But I just superimposed like whatever k-pop idol i was thinking of at the time and i rolled with it yeah mm. yeah it's funny that you say that arian because i think when i was left to make my own conclusion of what i thought she looked like uh considering how famous she was i assumed she was white and after i after i thought that thought i was like i guess i have to confront why i would assume that this like unbelievably gorgeous, famous pop star would be white as opposed to anything else, especially because I don't think any of our other characters in the stories have been white. I could be wrong on that, but I don't believe they were. Um, so, so yeah. And I guess with uh, Michael's point about Les, did you guys find it interesting that Les is actually what the character looked like prior to her her surgeries? Um, and did you notice? I guess a a connection or an importance in her falling in love with Les, even though she hated herself when she was herself, but she loves Les not knowing that she's herself, if that makes any sense. I 
I thought it was like kind of like a self love kind of moment. It was like, um, yeah, her finally uh, just accepting um, herself entirely. Um, and that explains why she always had this like yearning for her. I don't know if that's act that was actually in the story, but yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Arian. I will um I I'm definitely not disappointed, but I think it was a little bit um a little bit more forward than I would have like liked the moral of the story to be. Um felt very much like you're not you're not gonna get through the end of the story without without picking up this lesson because we're gonna like <laughs> throw it throw it throw it right out there as explicitly as possible. Um which which is is good sometimes, um, but I, I I think in this one I wanted to like work a little bit harder for it, um, and I definitely didn't. But um, I did I did I did pick up on that. It was very much uh, very much like learn learn to love yourself um, before it's too late, you know, life lessons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah. It's funny that you say that, Michael, because I think that's one of the reasons why I love this story so much, at least it's ending so much, is because it is so straightforward. I think most of the stories, you kind of have to come up with your own conclusion, and things are kind of left in mystery, and my brain was hurting after, like, consistently having to, like, do all this heavy thinking about what the story means. So I love, like, a very straightforward self-love story to kind of give me a break from all of that. Um, and yeah, I found it interesting that the main character is able to say that Les is not like strikingly beautiful or like doesn't even really stand out in terms of her looks, but it's her personality and who she is and how she treats her is what makes her love her. And that is where she finds her beauty and like who she is as a person as opposed to how she looks. Um, and it kind of, I guess, makes me sad that the main character had to like go through all of this just to come to that realization about herself. Um, yeah. And I guess I'm curious what you two thought of the ending of this story, because I didn't get that at all. Like, why are they climbing a building and, like, screaming out? Uh, did that make sense to two of you? Um, the ending didn't really make sense to me. I also am curious... Um, if you guys thought that she was a robot or like if there's like some like actual like person or like is this like some sort of supernatural um supernatural something but yeah the ending i uh it, it was interesting um i just uh with all of her with everything she did, I just reasoned them with it being her last night. So everything she's doing is um, tinged with um, like adrenaline, not adrenaline, but it's like tinged with um, this is my final moment. I might as well um, do anything and everything kind of. Um, I didn't think she was a robot. I thought she was uh, I think there was a certain point in the story where, like, she scared someone because she was just walking fleshy kind of skin thingy. I mm -hmm. So I thought of her as more of, like, a fleshy blob kind of thing that needed the mask to hold its shape or give it structure. Hmm. I didn't think of her as being a robot. I think it seemed like, I guess, her her like physical body was robotic we know that it was like there was a lot of surgery done on it especially her flesh uh her bones didn't seem to be like her actual bones uh anymore so but i think like her her brain her personality her her being was still there but it also did seem like maybe during the surgical process she was split in two it seemed like less had a bit more of the negative qualities because she seemed to me a little mean 
uh, whereas the main character seemed like this like really sweet, innocent character, um, or at least she knew she had to be to remain famous. Um, so I guess maybe during the surgery they split her up. Like here is one version of her that has like the perfect brain and and personality, and then there's a version of her that has like all the bad stuff, the boring stuff, the the meanness. Um, yeah. Does that, does that make sense to you, Michael, or do you think that she was a robot? Um, no, no, I think that makes sense. I don't necessarily think she was like an actual actual robot. I just the <laughs> the we got so much description of like the mechanics of like slipping her body apart that uh, <laughs> I I was just like there is something some some other thing here that I'm trying to make sense of that was not. Um, was not clicking and robot wasn't quite fitting that either but no mm. that helps thank you and i guess we can move on to uh the story nip uh what did you guys make of that story nip Um, okay, I guess I'll go first. I was wondering what the fuck uh, the, <laughs> she was the entire time, the companion, because it, she mentioned that she was small enough to fit in her drive's drawer and then bring her around everywhere. So I was wondering what she was the entire time until the end where uh, her home being a jar made sense. She was water. She was having difficulty trying to contain herself. Um, so that kind of distracted me from the entire story, or I guess that was the point, wondering what she was until the end. Um, I liked the story though, I really liked how it portrayed, um, jealousy. Um, like there was nothing about uh, directly stating it. Um, it was just comparisons between, um, things that the main character would do with her and how it lessened and then things how the main character was sort of drifting away from her um yeah i just want to know if you guys were wondering what she was the entire time as well um i definitely thought this one could have been uh Maybe about like, I don't want to say like drugs in particular, but it definitely felt like it was some some sort of narrative for, um, I don't remember the other character's name, um, but some sort of commentary on like escaping reality, uh, especially since we know that it's only like a, you know, it's like, like a once a year thing and she like goes all in um, and then it's like back, back on the shelf until until it's time for me to take my little like break from reality again. Um, so I kind of I kind of had that thought the whole time I was reading it. Um, I also thought a little bit like I don't want to say like genie because she's obviously not granting wishes, but um, <laughs> it, it, it did make me think like I don't know like like I dream of genie like coming out of the bottle. <laughs> but um, that's only because that she said that she was in the bottle, but. Um, no, those are those are my thoughts there, and I'm curious. Um, yeah, like but Jonathan, what what do you what do you think she was, and did either of you like make that connection to sort of like like escapism or trying to like you know avoid avoid reality, or or is there some some sort of like deeper deeper commentary here, or or connection to anything else that I suggested? Yeah, I had the same question. I was curious what she was. In my mind, I came to the conclusion that she was probably cocaine um, because she talks about fitting in a purse uh, and all that kind of stuff. But then when she says being in a bottle, I was like, well, you don't put cocaine in a bottle, as far as I know. Not that I would know, but as far as I do know, you don't put cocaine in a bottle. Um, and yeah, I guess to the escapism point, that for me also would read as like drugs or cocaine, especially because uh, she says she only takes me out for like 
during once a year for like special occasions. I'm something that she first met when her and her friend had like a lot of fun at a concert. Um, and like if she was water, I don't look at water as being a special <laughs> a special thing, I guess. Um, I mean, I drink water after a concert, I guess, but I don't look forward to it or I don't do it once a year. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, so I guess I just kind of speak to the escapism point. But then I'm also curious, why do you guys think that she chooses to go in the water in the end, knowing that the water would kill her? Um, death is the ultimate escape. <laughs> okay, real. Yeah. I feel like she um, wanted to die. Yeah, kind of. Uh, I feel like she noticed uh, the other character just slipping away from her. Uh, maybe she was just tired of it all. My observations are super surface level. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's what I thought. Yeah, I agree with the two of you. I think that uh, early in the story, the the character mentions that she doesn't like being in a physical body, but she only does it to make the uh, other girl, I don't remember her name, but the other female character happy. Um, and I think once she realized that, like, even being herself is no longer enough anymore um, because the girl begins to like fawn over this other guy they meet at a bar um, and they're like doing things that she can't. And I think she just kind of wanted to like show off, but at the same time she knew it would kill her. So I guess she was just kind of tired of being, having to be human and just wanted to go in, back into being nothing again. Um, but she also does relish in like the fact that the girl like tries to scoop her up and drink her. The fact that she's going to probably go back to the hotel room and like lick her off the walls, lick her off the sheets. Um, so yeah, did any, did either one of you guys notice that like relishing in like the other girl being so broken up over her her death? Um, I don't think I picked up on the part about her like going back to the room and like trying to get her off the sheets and stuff. But um, I I do remember her like like crying, trying to like like drink her um, and being being really broken up. Um, I think I don't remember. Is the other girl, is she, she's not married, is she? Or is she have like No, some... that's a different story, different story. Okay. <laughs> no, then, then wrong comment, but no, that's it. That's the end of my comment then. Um, yeah, I kind of did notice it. Um, the water girl, creature, liquid thingy, whatever. Um, like she came across as very juvenile so when she was relishing in it it was kind of like um writing a suicide note and then making it out to everybody and just imagining oh yeah this will get them this will yeah it was, it was giving that to me so i did notice it it was very in line with the with her self i guess yeah And the last story that I want to discuss is Natalia. Uh, I don't remember, did either one of you say you wanted to discuss any ones that came before that story? Or could we just go to Natalia? Oh, and say we got all three of mine. Yeah, I have no other stories. Okay. So then what did you two think of uh, Natalia? Um, it was an interesting swing from some of the other stories. Uh, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there was any sort of like 
supernatural or sci-fi element in this one, uh, which I'm definitely not complaining about. Um, but it definitely is like a little bit of a of a jump going from like outer space to like genie in a bottle to uh, m- medical notes, like back to back to back. Um, <laughs> But um, no, I did. I did like this one. I like the like different, different style of writing. I'm almost like a, like catalog or um, like like appendix or table of contents kind of kind of structure um, was definitely um, like a nice a nice break from some of the other things and definitely like an interesting, an interesting format uh, that I, I, I kept reading through this one um, without stopping. I mean, I think I read through all of them without stopping, but I did. I appreciated that part of it. Uh, Yeah. So so, uh, I really liked the story. It was like, almost like a coming of age sort of story um and i liked how uh, how different it was from the other stories i was expecting um the girl the autopsy girl to just wake up or like like wake up in the middle of it and talk or something like that happened but none of it ever happened so i was kind of I didn't know how to feel. I think there was like a second girl, a second love interest, Lucy, and I think um, it kind of confused me how um, their timelines differed. I didn't even notice that there was a second girl until like the story was almost finished. Um, So I thought that was kind of confusing. Other than that, uh, there's like, I when I, while I was reading it, it was like it was an edit. Like there was Lon Delray blasting in the background. It was scenic. I could envision it. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah, this is one I really loved as well. Uh, another one of my favorites. I think, I guess, being a nurse uh, throughout the entire story, I was thinking, could I, like, could I treat one of my exes? especially one who like kind of hurt me. I mean, I would have to obviously, but you know, like how would I feel like, I don't know. So all that just kind of came up for me. Um, But I love the way that it was structured as like an examiner's report. Um, I loved that like, while the main character is examining Natalia's body, like she's getting flashbacks of like all the times that she saw her body, touched her body. Um, So I loved all of that. and I guess I'm curious, since this story for me seemed like it had the most like yearning for someone, but we know that the main character is also married. Uh, do you think that the main character ever got over her love for Natalia, or do you think that she was still in love with her? Uh, I'm just, I never knew the main character was married, so I apparently I missed a lot of things in this story. I I think that she didn't get over her, no. I thought she committed suicide in the shower at the end. Did I get that wrong? Um, I'm not sure, but that's how I got the ending when she, um, blood was everywhere in the shower at the end. But no, to answer that question, I don't think she got over it. Uh, yeah, what did you think, Michael? Um, she's married to a man, right? Woman. Oh, okay. Um, man, I'm getting my stories all confused. Um, <laughs> I think that she probably likes the idea or like the nostalgia aspect of it. Um, but I don't know if it's like actually like real, real yearning as much as it, as much as it is, um, it's like memories of a, um, 
I don't a, uh, like a, a point in life where there there are some sort of like like milestones or something that she's reflecting on. Yeah, I think originally I read it as yearning, but I think you're right, Michael. Maybe it's not yearning. It's just maybe it's the main character like needing that last bit of closure, which doesn't seem like she really got. Um, it seemed like she loved Natalia when they first met, but then she finds out that Natalia is in a relationship with someone else. Um, so I guess she just never really got closure. And then like seeing her after all these years brings back up all these emotions that she had. Um, now, I know the two of you said you didn't really realize she was married, so maybe you won't have the answer to this question, but I'm curious if you thought that the relationship between her and her wife was healthy. Um, or did you look at it as being kind of like toxic and dysfunctional? Yeah. I no, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer to that. So um, maybe you do, Michael. Um, No, I actually was going to say um, I, I, I don't have an answer to the question, Jonathan, so I'm uh, very, very curious on your thoughts and your reasoning for them or if there's like any any specific evidence. Um, and I am I am going back through and wondering like how how did I miss this, especially because I thought that she was married to a man and I just like made, made the story into a whole other thing than it really was. Um, but yeah, where to share, please share your share your thoughts with us. Yeah, I think for me, her marriage came off as being very toxic. Um, I think that thought popped into my head first when uh, the main character's wife notices the the scars from her her previous uh, cutting in her 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 teen life and her adult life um, on her body. And then she tells her, if you do it again, I'm done with you. Um, I thought that was like very cruel to say to someone who clearly at least in the at least has a past of self-harm and a past of like not really feeling worthy or valuable. Um, to say that to her it feels like you're kind of throwing her away if she doesn't like do what you want, which I thought was so wrong, especially to someone that you end up marrying later on. Um, and then also to the main character, she knows that her wife obviously doesn't want her cutting herself, but she still does it and then like kind of forces the wife to get over it. And like she knows that she'll get over it. So she's like trying to manipulate her and like, I don't know, just like they both didn't really seem to have much care for the other's feelings. Um, so that to me read as toxic. Uh, so that's just my point on it. <laughs> Okay, well, that is all that I have. Before we wrap up, do either one of you have any other stories you want to talk about? Any other questions, comments in the book at all? Um, I had two two notes or, or questions. Um, one, I think this book just came out, right? Like last month? Uh, yeah, early early June, late June, I believe, actually. Um, so I don't know that's that's exciting. I don't think we've read a book that's like so so fresh. Um, so that's that's kind of cool. Um, so thank you for that, uh, whoever found this one and suggested it. Um, and I'm curious if anyone had any thoughts on like the the cover art um, and um, I don't think we got any male-centered stories, um, and I wonder, I wonder if you guys had any, any thoughts on that, or if I, I left one out or didn't catch, but I don't, I don't think there were any, um, you know, obviously it is, it is a female author, um, so that, that may be part of it, um, but I was just curious if you guys picked up on that.
Uh, yeah, no, I didn't. I picked up on there being no male point of view in the story. I think the closest ever was um, Lemon Boy, where a large part of the story, not a large, but like a noticeable part of the story was just him recounting the his ex-girlfriend disappearing with the holes. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I did notice there were no male-led stories. It didn't bother me, I guess, in my mind, a female writer would write stories about women. Um, and that just kind of makes the most sense to me. Uh, but yeah, to Arian's point, I do think that Lemon Boy is probably the closest we get to, like, one being told from a, a male narrative. And now that you mentioned Lemon Boy, I'm a little bit curious. I don't want to talk about that story too much because I don't have much to say, but... Did you guys read that story as like trauma or like depression or suicide or, or suicide being uh, contagious at all? Uh, a little bit, yeah. It felt like, um, yeah. I don't. I don't know if I necessarily thought thought suicide but definitely like some sort of like like de depression related thing or or delusion um yeah is being being contagious especially the part where like the girl is just like latching on because the guy says that he like gets it um felt felt very much like textbook definition of trauma bonding um <laughs> so i did i i did pick up on that part. Uh, or did did have a similar a similar thought rather um i did it i just took the story as it went i was like um yeah the holes they make sense this is supernatural i might as well just like um roll with it i probably should um try and dig deeper and try and observe the stories more but yeah no i did not make that connection sometimes there is nothing deeper in the story and you will drive yourself crazy trying to find something uh, so don't don't be too hard on yourself <laughs> thank you yeah I, I think for me i did read as depression or suicide being contagious. Uh, I think especially because in all the moments where the characters who die, die, no one around them seems to notice. Um, like I think, for example, at the rave where Lemon Boy's girlfriend dies, like everyone around her is like screaming, jumping, having fun, and no one can notice this girl whose body was literally cut in half. Um, and I guess that could be a euphemism for like depression. Like sometimes people just can't see it if they're not paying close enough attention or are not as concerned about you as maybe they should be. Um, and the same even for Lemon Boy, when he walks into the hole, when the main characters tries to ask other party goers if they remember him, no one seems to even notice he was there, which is interesting because he is described as this like freakishly tall boy with like bright neon yellow hair. Like how could you not notice that? But again, that's a situation where everyone is having so much fun that they can't even notice someone who's like clearly, who clearly is meant to stick out. Um, and I think the contagious part comes through for me because every character, every subsequent character who watches someone else die um, through one of the holes, they begin to then dye their own hair crazy colors and then see holes. Like we know Lemon Boy, he began to dye his hair and see the holes after his girlfriend died. And then the main character does the same thing at the end of her story. Um, so yeah, that to me is right as like, it must be contagious. Um, or even just the trauma of watching someone die being contagious. Yeah. So that's all I have. Um, before we move on, any final thoughts on anything in the book? Or can we move on? I'm good. Yep, I'm good to go. 
Okay. Well, since we do have one more meeting left this month, I won't bring up uh, a book for the month of uh, of August, but I am curious what genres the two of you want to see. Um, for me personally, I know our next story is going to be very, very heavy. So I, I would prefer something lighter, uh, perhaps a love story or something comedic. Uh, what do you two think about or what genres do you two want to get into next month? Um, I actually like the idea of a love story. I don't think we've done one, have we? Um, or at least not one with a happy ending. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm all for that idea, but um, you know, I I will just always say that I am, I personally am pretty open. I don't have any strong opinions uh, on what we read as long as um, you know it's getting me to like finish a book and think about it. That's that's the important part for me. Um, yeah, I'm all about love stories. So a love story would be right up my alley. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, cool. Uh, I think I'll I'll try and pick a love story um, as well. There's one I have in mind. It's another new a new book that I think came out earlier last month. Um, I won't give it away because I just don't want to ruin the surprise. But I do. I'm curious, what are you guys' I guess feelings or thoughts about like reading books with like heavy sexual elements? And then of course having a discussion about that. Is everyone comfortable discussing and reading sex? Do some people really not like that? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I don't have any issues with it. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I have no problems with it either. Okay, cool. Because the book I have in mind, uh, it is described essentially like an erotic adult novel. Um, I guess think like Fifty Shades of Grey, but like gay. Uh, I read a sample of it and yeah, there's definitely like it's like nonstop sex throughout the entire novel. Um, so I'm down. Uh, I guess as a nurse, I view sex as being like part of nature. It doesn't bother me, um, but I'm glad that you guys feel the same way. Uh, so I'll bring that up next meeting. Um, and yeah, that's that's it for today, I guess. Does anyone else have any burning questions, comments, concerns about the book, about the club, about anything before we go? Oh, um, no, just thank you to both of you, uh, to Jonathan always for doing the the work of making book club happen uh, and to uh, Arian for your your contributions and, and thoughts and uh, you know, joining joining in and giving it your all. I appreciate the uh, discussion and effort everyone puts into this. So that's all for me. Well, thank you. Um, pretty much the same vein. Um, thanks for the small sense of community that this book club offers. And um, thank you to Jonathan for always hosting and yeah, putting in the effort and work. Thank you. Mm. No problem, you too. Well, thank you both for coming, and uh, hopefully I see you both in two weeks to discuss the House of Impossible Beauties. Um, but until then, uh, you both have a nice day, and I guess that's it. <laughs> have a nice day. <laughs> yes, yeah, see you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.